I'm going to be talking today about divine command theory. Divine command theory is a view of ethics that has it depending on God. The general idea is that what's right or wrong, just or unjust, good or bad, depends in some way on God's attitudes. On some versions of the theory, it's on God's command. Something is right if and only if God commands it. On other views, it depends on God's approval, God's loving something, as in Plato's Euthyphro, or a variety of other attitudes that God might have. We might be worried primarily about positive attitudes, like love, approval, command, maybe negative attitudes, like prohibitions, or disapproval, dislike. In any event, the general idea is that the moral status of an action depends on some attitude of God. And so, there is a sense in which God's attitudes are primary, and moral status is secondary. Whether we consider something in deontic terms, like right or wrong, just or unjust, or in evaluative terms, like good or bad, we're thinking of something, in ethics at least, depending on some pro or con attitude, some positive or negative attitude of God. So there are many different kinds of divine command theory, many different forms this theory could take, depending on the moral status we focus on and the divine attitude that we choose to see as its basis. A theory based on approval and disapproval will be different from one depending on commands and prohibitions. One focusing on evaluative concepts like good and bad is going to be different from one focusing primarily on deontic concepts like right and wrong. But there are other differences among various versions of divine command theory. One important version is the nature of the connection between divine attitudes and moral status. Just how strong is that link and what's the nature of the link? Here is a strong form in which divine command theory has often been expressed. The idea is that something has a certain moral status if and only if God has a certain kind of attitude toward it. So, for example, something is right if and only if God commands it, or something is good if and only if God approves of it, and so on. Of course, the necessary and sufficient connection between moral status and divine attitudes does not itself determine the exact nature of that connection. It has something to do with its strength, but the nature is different. We might say, after all, that something has a certain positive moral status, if and only if God has a positive attitude toward it in some way. Still, what is responsible for that necessary and sufficient connection, exactly what the nature of the relationship is, is left undetermined. Still, on this sort of view, there is a very strong connection. Something has a positive moral status, let's say, if and only if God has a positive attitude toward it. It has a negative moral status, if and only if God has a negative attitude toward it. And presumably, it has some neutral moral status, if God has a neutral attitude toward it, or has no attitude toward it at all. But there are other forms that a divine command theory might take. We might think, for example, that divine approval, or some other positive attitude of God, is a necessary condition for something having a positive moral status. We might also have a negative version of this approach to say that God's having a negative attitude toward something is a necessary condition of its having a negative moral status. So we might say that something is bad only if God disapproves of it, or something is good only if God approves it. This leaves the exact nature of the connection undetermined, just as in the case of necessary and sufficient conditions. But the idea here is that instead of the set of things toward which God has a positive attitude and the set of things that have a positive moral status being exactly the same set, instead one is a subset of the other. So if it's true that God's positive attitude, for example, is a necessary condition for positive moral status, then we could say that anything with a positive moral status has divine approval, for example, has that positive divine attitude, and so we could say that those things with positive moral status are at least a subset of the things approved by God. If we put it in the negative form to say that a negative divine attitude is a necessary condition for negative moral status, like something is bad only if God disapproves of it, then we can say that the same sort of subset relation holds those things that have a negative moral status or a subset of the things disapproved by God. There are other forms that such a theory could take. 
So, for example, we could think that divine attitudes are sufficient to determine moral status, but not necessary. That would be a way of weakening that necessary and sufficient connection, and it would lead to the opposite kind of subset relation. But the general idea would be this. Here's one way in which something can be good, for example. God approves of it. Here's one way in which something can be right. God commands it. Here's one way in which something might be bad. God disapproves it. Here's one way in which something might be morally wrong. It's because God disapproves it. This leaves open the possibility that there are other factors involved. That is, that there are other ways of something being morally good or morally bad, morally right or morally wrong. Again, the exact nature of the theory depends on the nature of the moral status, the moral concepts that we're focusing on, and the nature of the divine attitudes. But it would be plausible on this view to say, here's one way in which something can be a moral requirement. God orders it. God commands it. But there might be other ways in which something could be a moral requirement. Similarly, thou shalt not. Some things might be prohibited because God specifically prohibits them. But other things might be prohibited for other reasons. Presumably, God doesn't care what the rules of American football are. However, it might be that to cheat according to the rules of American football, if you're playing that game, is prohibited. So the general idea here would be this. God's attitudes determine the moral status of certain actions and certain things. But other things depend on, let's say, human conventions or other factors that have nothing to do with God's particular attitudes. Unless it, it turns out God is, for example, a football fan or a chess fan, or in some other way has attitudes about basically everything. Presumably, we might think, look, there a lot of morality depends on human relationships and the conventions we adopt for those relationships that don't have anything directly to do with the attitudes of God. We could weaken even that view a bit further. We could say that divine attitudes are sometimes sufficient to establish moral status, but not always. So, for example, divine disapproval, in some cases, actually determines that something is morally wrong. That divine command actually, in some cases, makes it morally right. But we could leave open the possibility that sometimes that's not true. Sometimes God could command something, even though it's wrong. God might prohibit something that is actually morally acceptable. Now, why would you adopt a view like that? Well, you might be thinking about biblical cases in which, for example, God orders Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. In the end, he doesn't have him go through with it, but still you could think that order seems to be in order to do something immoral. And the same thing is something that emerges, for example, in the book of Joshua. You could say God commands all sorts of things in the book of Joshua involving the conquest of the Holy Land that strike us as pretty immoral. Now, you could try to defend them and say, no, 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 they're not immoral after all. You could think that the fact that God commands them just makes them right. But you could also say, mm, this is a case in which God seems to command things even though they're morally wrong. So God's commands in some cases determine moral wrongness or moral rightness, whether something's good or bad, again, the moral status. But it might be that in some cases it doesn't. In some cases, it is either overridden by something else, but it's a little surprising to find out that God could be overridden. Or you might say, look, God's command suffices to determine some kind of status, but it's not necessarily a moral status. It might be that if God tells you to do something, you should do it. But only sometimes does that make it the morally right thing to do. Sometimes, maybe, he's asking you to do something over and above and even contrary to morality. That's how Kierkegaard sees it when he talks about the teleological suspension of the ethical. He doesn't think that God's command to Abraham actually would make killing or preparing to kill Isaac right. He thinks it would still be wrong. It's just that in this case, we set ethical considerations aside. On a view like that, we could say sometimes God's approval, God's command, in general, God's attitudes are sufficient to determine moral status. But in other cases, they really don't. They tell us maybe 
to set morality aside for the sake of something higher. Perhaps religious obligations in some cases are actually higher than and take precedence over moral status. We've been talking about the logical strength of the connection between moral status and divine attitudes. But actually, that's not all that's at stake. We need to think about the nature of that connection. What is the nature of the connection between divine attitudes and moral status, according to divine command theory? Well, again, there can be a variety of approaches one might take. So here's another dimension on which divine command theories can vary. We might say, for example, that it is a strict reductive relationship. That is to say, we could translate moral language into language about divine attitudes. So something is right, for example, if and only if God approves of it, or God commands it, or God has some pro-attitude toward it. In general, we might look for equations like that, statements like, this has a certain moral status if and only if God has this kind of attitude toward it. And that would be one approach. A second approach would be to talk about supervenience, to say that in some way, moral status supervenes on divine attitudes. But that doesn't necessarily allow us to trace the individual statements that would link moral status and divine attitudes. So we might say whatever moral status this has, it has it because God has a certain set of attitudes toward it. And so if God has these attitudes, that fixes the moral status of things. But we might not see the detailed nature of the connections. So here would be one way of thinking that might happen. We might think that divine attitudes determine moral status. If God has this set of attitudes about something, that determines its moral status, even though what determines the moral status of this might be different from what determines the moral status of that. And so that determination or dependence relation is something that we can't really track down in terms of a general formula. Another possibility is to say that moral status is grounded in divine attitudes. So the idea would be that the metaphysical ground of moral status is really the set of attitudes God has about something. That would be a way of saying, look, we don't need some special status, some special arrangement, some special metaphysical realm for moral normativity. It's really just something that arises out of divine attitudes. But, not as with supervenience, exactly how it does it, we can't spell out in a formula. But in addition to that, we might say that this grounding is something that is a little more general than a supervenience relation. A supervenience relation could be viewed, and here's a long story I won't go into, but could be viewed as a kind of infinitary generalization of the idea of formulas. We could think that instead of having one formula or a finite set of formulas that would explain the connection, we could have something like an infinite collection of those connections. And the grounding relation is even more general than that. Maybe we couldn't even do that. The supervenience and grounding ideas are consistent with the idea that we can't really spell out in a precise way the connections between moral status and divine attitudes. So this sort of theory says what happens in the moral sphere is determined by God's attitudes about things. Still, we can't say exactly what the connections are. If somebody says this act is wrong, we can say, well, that's because God has negative attitudes about it. But we can't say exactly what it is in general for something to be wrong. Yes, God may have negative attitudes, but which attitudes precisely? Maybe we leave that open. Maybe it's sometimes God doesn't like that. <laughs> sometimes God, hmm, you know, has some serious questions about that. Maybe sometimes it's God prohibits that entirely and so forth. And so we might worry that there's no way to really spell out the connections in detail. Talking about supervenience or grounding allows for that possibility that the nature of the connections is known only to God, but can't really be articulated by us.